So this is all about collaboration, and uh, you know we're going to talk about that. And of course, the first thing that happens <laughs> is we're sitting in here. We have this really slick, high-end microphone system that we normally use for these things, and of course, uh, today it chose to not work. So we're coming coming to you live via a uh, backup system. Always pays to have backup. In the year 2020. Yeah. <laughs> this year cannot end soon enough. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're probably good um, as far as attendees are concerned, as far as I can tell. So we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on collaborative product development in a virtual world. My name is Casey Branson. I'm the Director of Business Development here at M3 Design, and I'll be your moderator for today. Joining me are our presenters, John Bernero and Gray McCord. John is our COO and Gray is our CTO here at M3 Design. Today's presentation will take 35 minutes with five to 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. You may type in your questions at any time. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to John and Gray. Okay, Gray, it's all yours. Okay, let's hope this part works. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> There we go. There you go. Can you hear me now? No, I'm only kidding. We're good. All right. So this will take you know roughly 45 minutes, uh, less if, if uh, I speak fast. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is essentially uh, you know what's changed in product development as a result of the uh, the pandemic in particular, and we're going to focus on the the one area of today of concept development. So we'll talk a little bit about what's changed and also what we learned about that you know maybe wasn't optimal in the first place right so uh, this isn't all bad news and then probably the fun part here is uh, as we've gone through the last uh, nine months with everybody else of course uh, we've found some really interesting virtual collaboration tools that we're going to talk about that kind of cover some of the main areas of uh, uh, concept development and then we'll talk a little bit about where, where we see the future going, and then we'll open it up for your questions. Okay, but before we uh, get too much further, uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes and talk about concept development in general. So, you know, concept development is usually not just one person sitting by themselves uh, in a room with some jolt colas uh, coming up with a great idea. It's a process. And, uh, you know, while you may... Uh, do it slightly differently. I think, you know, generally speaking, everybody's everybody's going to approach concept development in a similar fashion here. So let me kind of go through the steps for you real quick. So the first part, and uh, you know, this is actually the fun part, is getting together and ideating uh, to come up with you know, potential ideas for new products to solve problems, that kind of thing. So you know, we look at technology. We look for analogous products that you know might provide some level of inspiration, you know. But fundamentally, this is a team sport, right? Usually, it involves a bunch of people having a good time in a room, and you know, last for several hours, and we get all sorts of really interesting, uh, you know, great results from that. So you can see problem number one. So once we get down to the point where some of the uh, the ideas have been discussed at some length, we're going to start to visualize those, right? So now. You take an idea and we're going to sketch it out, you know, just to make sure that, you know, see how things fit, uh, see how, see what it could be, evaluate the potential, kind of get like quick sketches in front of people to do some, you know, sort of initial evaluation of, uh, of the concepts. And once we're done with that, then we get into the real quick and dirty part. So a lot of times, um, what you want to do after you have a after you have a sketch is you want to sort of mock these things up, right? You get a sense for, you know, how big they are, how much they might weigh, how they might feel in your hand, that kind of thing. Just before you do a whole lot of, you know, detailed engineering work, you really want to get a sense for uh, for what this thing uh, could be, what it feels like, and how it might uh, actually use. And, and you just do this for internal evaluation purposes. It helps refine the uh, refine the concepts. And once you've gotten through that, then the engineers are going to come in, and we're going to do something you know we call concept CAD here. Uh, but but basically, uh, what you want to do is convert 
the, the idea and the sketches and the mock-ups into, into 3D CAD at, at a really basic block level so that you can verify that things will fit, that there's no like real uh, you know, engineering uh, you know, issues that, that would prevent you from actually creating a product. It's not a, not a, a design system at this point, but it's just you know, sort of making sure that a block level thing fits. And then once, uh, once you get past that phase, and, and the last few phases generally, you know, you can kind of do that individually or you know, remotely. That's not really a huge deal. Uh, when we start getting into the prototyping phase, it gets a little more complicated. Uh, one thing I want to point out, there's no like single prototype. So what happens here is we're looking at creating different types of prototypes for different purposes, right? So you can have a looks like prototype that would be used to, you know, to show it to people to get a sense for look and feel and how much it weighs, things like that. And then you might want to create a works like prototype that could look nothing like the real thing, but it gives you, it simulates the functionality so you can get a sense for, uh, for how it might operate. And there's other types as well. So the point is there's different types of prototypes for different purposes. And, you know, these all have to be, uh, be created for the next part. Which is where the team sport uh, <clears throat> returns. So, when you get to the evaluation of the concepts, usually that involves uh, you know putting these prototypes in front of real human beings. It's sometimes in group settings, and in fact, most of the time in group settings, which is kind of a challenge right now, if you might guess. So, what you're doing here is you're is you're, you're sort of testing the product against its requirements. Uh, and you're trying to gather feedback from you know, your executive staff, for example, your manufacturing people, and your, you know, your customers and support staff and others. That's how it used to work up until, uh, what, what do you say, John, about February or something about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we kind of all got thrown a wrench into things, and um, we quickly had to kind of change things. We People started to uh, pack up their desks, grab their monitors, their uh, desktops, and otherwise, and and uh, headed home. And so, um, although we had some tools to be collaborative and everything, working with you know outside parties and everything else, um, internally we we really uh, benefited from all being under one roof, and uh, you know to just collaborate very well. So yeah, that was a that was a tough time. I I had PTSD there for a while because the last time I watched a bunch of people in an office walking out with computers and office equipment was when my startup failed about 20 <laughs> years ago. I, I don't have fond memories of that, you know, so got past that. But, you know, here we are nine months later and I'm you know, sitting in a room wearing a mask trying to figure out what day of the week it is. So, you know, things have certainly changed. It's, yeah. It's Wednesday, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, things change, and you know, I think part of this too is you know we had projects going on, and I'm sure everyone on the phone did too, and those timelines and expectations uh, didn't change, and so we had to figure out how to kind of shift, and we couldn't visit people, we couldn't travel, uh, we had research activities kind of planned with customers, and all that stuff kind of went to the wayside, so we had to kind of shift and and kind of divert. So let's get into, um, you know, you know, as Gray mentioned, our concept development phase was very collaborative and, and, and it really benefited from that. We were able to make decisions real quick. Uh, on the fly, we could kind of evaluate concepts and prototypes um, and we're able to essentially kind of make some decisions. But then, you know, I think what we're facing today and we're, we're, we're figuring this out as we're doing it is just we've really lost that real-time feedback that we once benefited, right? The, the time walking between meetings and, and talking, up, talking to someone real quick and getting a quick update before you ran into it, um, as well as just that whole immersive, you know, collaboration, right? There's nothing like a brainstorm meeting where you kind of, you know, around all these different ideas and, you know, webcams and screen sharing just don't take, you know, it's just not the same. Um, and I think for companies that really um, have a strong culture and really look at having a good personal connection with their internal team members and their customers, a lot of that kind of was stretched and, and really, um, uh, some of it was actually lost, unfortunately. So, um, you know, again, none of these challenges that I list here are new. I think we all face that, right? I mean, I think we all quickly jumped onto the Zoom train, and um, I think that novelty quickly died along with, you know, 
our ability to continue with camaraderie and team dynamics. Um, and then, but I think at the same time, we we had team, uh, you know, parents and others that were actually all of a sudden using that as well. And uh, what's pretty clear is that it's really not meant for you know the wide um, demographics of people uh, with different technical abilities. Um, we lost that in, loss of impromptu interruptions. You know, everything had to be scheduled now. Uh, we're getting messages through email, IM, or text messages. Um, I think we started realizing that we were now stuck in front of a computer all day. Um, it was hard to find time just to go to the bathroom or just, you know, getting outside for lunch. Um, <laughs> Speak to yourself. Uh, so, and then of course, you know, customers can't see you. Even you know, though you had projects going on, you had to make some decisions and get some feedback. Um, it was very difficult or impossible to actually get in front of them. So a lot of that stuff went on hold, and I think companies had to kind of uh, shift. And as Gray mentioned, you know, prototypes, uh, normally we make one, and then we all huddle around that. And uh, now all of a sudden uh, that became a little bit difficult, and people try to, you know, put that prototype up to the webcam, and it was shaky, and we lost a lot of time on, on that. And just the fact that, you know, we need good Internet connection and, uh, you know, how many times have we said that someone's frozen or, or they're on mute? So uh, if we could get all those minutes back, that'd be great. Or the microphone doesn't work. Or the microphone, yeah. But, you know, despite all this, uh, we actually learned some things that actually were broken. I mean, some things that, um, some inefficiencies uh, that we actually had were, or were dealing with, with the way that things were in the past. Um, I mean, how many times have we had meetings where we really needed key stakeholders and just to get them available um, you know, it took months of planning in advance to get them on to have some time on their schedule. But now all of a sudden they were actually available and we we're able to, you know, review things quickly and make decisions faster. Uh, people were actually happy to hear from you, um, at least at the beginning. I don't know if it was everyone in the pajamas or the fact that no one was going to work with road rage um, or just trying to avoid your kids. Um, but uh, people were definitely happy to talk and, you know, both customers and, and, and employees and then um, all of a sudden, I think, you know, especially with, you know, sketch concepts and other very visual presentations, nothing's worse than being on that one of those calls and realizing someone's driving along the way while they're taking your call. And then you have to set up a follow-up meeting or send a deck afterwards. And, uh, you know, I think overall we found some inefficiencies in the way that things were doing just because we're all busy, we're all traveling, and, and that really um, avoided our ability to make decisions quickly and and faster. So the remote work actually benefited in other ways. So, um, so let's get into the, the meat and potatoes uh, of this project, or sorry, this presentation. And you know, although you know, software development teams have really been able to do this for a while in terms of being able to collaborate virtually. Uh, when we're designing physical products, that really poses a new challenge, as as Gray mentioned. And you know, we we actually. Uh, uncovered some tools, some tools we are actually using before, um, but we also kind of uncovered some new tools um, that we'd like to kind of share with you. So let's go ahead and get into that. Yeah. Let's talk about collaboration tools first. So, you know, the good news is that there are a pretty robust number of collaboration tools out there, right? And, you know, they all work pretty well. The bad news is that, you know, I don't know about your case, but in ours, you know, we've got a bunch of engineers and designers and people were kind of like using whatever they felt like using, right? So we had we had a few people using Asana to track paths and a bunch of people were using Slack for who knows what. We were using Basecamp with a couple of our clients for a while. And it's a pretty good tool. Uh, Skype. In some cases, you know, I mean, you go through the list and there's, there's many more, but the issue is that uh, collaboration doesn't work really well when you're all on different collaboration tools. So the first thing we had to do is sort of, you know, for learning was to figure out what can we put people on that solves most of the problem and gets everybody in a, in a common space. And in our case, uh, we picked Microsoft Teams, which, to be totally honest, when we started, it was not an obvious choice because, you know, back in the February, March time frame, Teams, Teams frankly, was pretty crappy. <laughs> you know, I we would never use it for video conferencing. Um, you know, the, the thing it had going for it was that, you know, we could, uh, you know, share files, you know, office files, things like that. So it's pretty good. However, Teams has, like, progressed amazingly, which is kind of a trend on all these tools, right? is that they've gotten uh, tremendously better over time. So, so that's the good news. And don't forget the VPN access that, oh, you know. Please. So. I try to forget that. 
one cool tool that we found. So one of the big deals that we do, uh, we do a lot of brainstorming at M3, uh, you know, co-collaboration, workshops, things like that. And we've been accused at times of actually being a subsidiary of 3M because we use so many sticky notes, right? So what we do is we tend to get into a room and we have, we like plaster the wall with ideas and concepts on notes. And we, you know, we, we move sticky notes around to, uh, to organize and things like that. Well, we uncovered a uh, tool called Miro, uh, which basically allows us to do that in a virtual mode. As you can see by all this stuff moving around on your screen, you know, we basically create virtual sticky notes and comments, and uh, anybody who is on uh, a meeting call, for example, can go in and edit that in real time. You can do close collaboration. And one of the side benefits of this is when we were using sticky notes, you know, we always had to go in, we take pictures of it, and we you know, try to you know, translate that into a presentation and organize it. With Miro, we just kind of do that in Miro, and then we can export images, and it really cut down on the overhead of presentation creation. So we are super happy with this tool. I, I, hate, I don't want this to be an advertisement yeah. for them, but there's probably other tools that do this, but uh, <clears throat> this is a really good example of, of this kind of uh, tool. Yeah, so when we get into actually product design and, and CAD, um, normally use SolidWorks and, and Creo here, um, but you know, Onshape I think is a pretty interesting one. I think you can best describe it as uh, Google Docs for CAD. And the reason for that is that it makes it really easy to share information. It's completely web-based, um, so you don't need to actually have any type of hardware or software um, requirements uh, on your machine. As long as you have a browser, you can do it. Um, you can share files with uh, your vendors, with uh, your other individuals, um, and then quickly take away that, uh, that access uh, when you're done with that discussion. The, the power of it, though, is that the fact that um, you can have multiple people working on the same assembly or um, part at the same time, and uh, you have real-time visibility of uh, any design updates. You don't need to check in and check out files. Uh, you don't have to worry about people who go on vacation and forgot to do their check-in, and now you're reaching out to them, trying to figure out how to get the latest. Um, but you can, um, again, it's, it's just a virtual collaboration tool. We, uh, people can edit CAD on their phones. Um, it's, it's very powerful. And I think this is where things are going. I think with the file-based structure of some of these other systems that we're normally using, uh, there's, it doesn't allow for real-time collaboration. Um, the other nice thing is you can add uh, comments um, and uh, allow for real-time uh, editing on the fly. Um, another one that's pretty interesting here is called Spatial, and there's a couple other companies that do something very similar to this, but it's a, it's a taken kind of like Miro, but taken it to kind of more of a, an AR, VR, or AR type of environment. Um, what's nice about it is you can have, um, you can have both in-person collaboration, so you, you and someone else can be collaborating, but then you can dial in someone from afar, and they can actually be in your virtual space at the same time. Um, Kind of like the sticky notes and everything else that Gray was mentioning, it actually has that potential, has the ability to uh, pull in, um, you know, concepts, uh, ability to kind of, you know, talk through different ideas um, and really immerse the team uh, into a very creative uh, environment. And the best of all, um, you just take off your headset, shut down, and, and your room is back to uh, a clutter-free uh, environment, um, and the information is there to go the next time you're ready to log in. That lady might give me some nightmares now. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> cool. So much for this high-tech stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to go low-tech now. So virtual prototyping is an interesting thing. So one of the things that happens, you know, people are stuck at home. Uh, they may be able to come into the office occasionally, but generally not. So one of the things that we uncovered was that there are low-tech solutions to this, right? So people wound up using whatever they had access to to be able to prototype, right? And, I'm, you know, we have some people that have, you know, like metalworking shops woodworking shops, uh, we use PVC pipe, you know, two by fours, glue guns, glitter, you name it. Whatever, whatever people had available to them, they actually used to, uh, to create simple prototypes so they could express uh, you know, concept ideas uh, with each other uh, virtually. One thing that is happening is, you know, uh, at-home 3D printers are getting like really inexpensive. So we, uh, you know, we have a few people that have those, uh, but they're, really handy, you know, they have their limitations, but uh, they actually work pretty well when you when you have them. Yeah. And then 
a little more high tech. So this is a tool called Gravity Sketch, which you know essentially allows uh, teams to uh, create and review, you know, in a 3D VR environment together. I think it's got a ways to go to become truly useful, but I think this gives you a sense for <clears throat> for, for the possibility of having you know three or four engineers or designers working together to create something in, in three dimensions without having to be uh, you know, in a room together. Yeah, I think what's powerful about this too is also the uh, uh, ability to get a customer into looking at what you're designing and, and kind of and what you see here is sitting into like the dashboard and kind of walking through what works or doesn't work or things that need to change. So, yeah. um, this is not new. Um, so this is you know augmented reality for CAD and now VR for CAD is, is something that's been around for a while. This is an old picture that eDrawings had done back in, I think it was 2013, where it required you to essentially print out a QR code, put it on a surface, and then you upload um, you essentially have your CAD um, on a tablet or a phone, and using their application, you can actually uh, scale the unit um, and move it around uh, within your environment. Um, this has since then changed, and now it actually, uh, you know, systems are smarter now, so they can actually recognize flat surfaces already. Um, and I think, you know, this is kind of a, a kind of a nice way where it doesn't require any sort of VR goggles to, to use. Um, obviously, if you use Google Cardboard, you could always uh, just use your phone in that in that place instead. Uh, and talk about VR, um, sometimes we do develop concepts uh, that are a little bit larger than life. Um, uh, so sometimes it, it just makes more sense instead of actually making a physical mock-up or a prototype is just to kind of create the whole environment and be able to have yourself or your customers actually um, walk through the space, talk through kind of design updates or changes that need to be done. Uh, we know that some of our clients in the aerospace medical industry are using this for um, interior aircraft as well as for operating room uh, design, but um, you know this is definitely an interesting one which we ended up using here on this product line that we end up working on called Home Run Dugout. So, Pretty cool. And then um, sometimes you know the reality is is sometimes you still need to be in person. Um, I think there are instances that that's going to always have to uh, be the case. Um, and so when you can't be 100% virtual, uh, you know by just having a fewer number of team members together um, does one of two things. One, in this case, being socially distanced is important, but two, it's also a cost savings. Um, but you know, with newer technology, with 5G and, and better internet connectivity, um, live streaming of prototype evaluations um, is gonna be more used than ever before, I believe. Nothing new, um, but I think what we're gonna see is teams are gonna be doing, uh, participating or viewing some of these live events a little bit um, more often. Uh, now you can get teams from across the globe um, seeing and hearing the same things. And um, I don't know you, but you know, there's been instances where you know, when presenting you know, research feedback information, there's always someone that's questioning the results or questioning if there's bias uh, in, in kind of what you're presenting. And by having a larger team actually seeing and hearing the same thing at the same time, it's great. And by including multiple image uh, sources, where it be, you know, you know, overhead cameras or a 360 cameras, um, the ability to kind of look at different views at the same time um, allows each team member who is participating remotely to be able to see and um, hear what they're actually most interested in. And then sometimes you have to just get uh, kind of old school and, and, and ship stuff out. Um, you know, I think we can take this opportunity and actually make some thoughtful uh, packages of, of kind of this prototype and, and you know maybe ship it to maybe you have five customers that you need to um, have evaluate a, a prototype of yours but it's impossible to make five of these units at the same time so instead of doing that making one set and then sending it around and having them essentially mail it to the next person but uh, with some thought um, you can definitely uh, get some one-on-one -on -one feedback actually by each of the users before you do a group setting. Um, so the nice thing about something like this is you can kind of gather that feedback and then come back and consolidate uh, everyone together afterwards. Uh, but again, I think um, rather than just throwing in a FedEx box and throwing it in this with some bubble wrap, taking the next step further, making sure they have everything they need here um, and some instructions um, uh, and the ability to quickly ship it to the next uh, person would be important. And who doesn't like to get free stuff in the mail? I know. <laughs> Bye.
All right. So, you know, as you can see, there's an awful lot of, uh, you know, interesting tools out there. We just touched on a few of them, but make no mistake, there is a lot of room for growth in this area. Uh, you know, if you look at online meeting experiences, you know, it's, to be completely honest, they're still not great. I mean, even yesterday I was, I was using, uh, you know, Google Meet. And for some reason, Google Meet will not work with my Bluetooth headphones. I don't know why. It you just doesn't. Apple right? headphones? Casey, Casey has a nightmare every time she <laughs> tries to do it. So, I mean, you know, usually the integration and, you know, the usability still has a, a ways to go on a lot of those to make them uh, easier and, and more mistake proof. Um, I think, you know, AR and VR is, is becoming widely adapted, especially as the cost is starting to go down. And I think we'll see a lot more of that uh, going forward. But once again, same thing. The hardware is pretty specialized. The software can be kind of clunky to set it up, and you know it still needs to be uh, be improved. Um, <clears throat> Internet connectivity is another big one, right? I don't know how many times, and this has probably happened to you, maybe happening to some of you right now, where you know if your internet service isn't great, you might get dropouts and you know lack of audio and video things like that. I think that uh, you know 5G is coming along. And that's going to be a while before that goes anywhere. Um, Skylink could help, that kind of thing. So that's definitely a plus. I think people are finally trusting uh, cloud-only data management, although, you know, once again, that's still a potential security hole. Uh, that's, that still needs some improvement. You know, you don't like putting things up there and then finding out, you know, a month later that Microsoft or Apple is uh, looking at stuff they shouldn't be looking at. I think uh, in a lot of cases, you know, we found some great tools, but they don't all integrate with each other. So I think that there's an opportunity for standards to be set to uh, allow for consolidation and collaboration of the collaboration tools, right? So that it works better. And then uh, finally, uh, data security. Uh, that's my bugaboo from day one. Anytime you move something outside of the absolute control of the data owner, you are at risk, and you know that as soon as you put something in the cloud, you get a thousand people out there trying to steal it or hack it, and we still have uh, quite a ways to go on that to, you know, before that becomes reasonably safe. So beware. Yeah. So we shared what we know. Um, you, you don't get to sit there and do nothing. What we're going to ask you to do now is, you know, let us know. You know, have you found tools or techniques? Uh, that have helped you uh, perform concept development during this uh, interesting time. So if you have some ideas or something you want to share, go ahead and uh, you know, type it into your webinar control panel and we'll uh, review that a little bit later in the webinar. Thanks, Craig. So yeah, as we're talking about tools that we're currently using, I think some tools that um, we definitely see are, are um, Essentially, not quite ready for prime time, but they will be here soon. Um, you know, the fact is, is that a lot of these tools are not going to go away, and, and, and but instead, they're actually going to be expanded and become more life mainstream as we know it. And although, you know, the pandemic really turned uh, kind of how we do work uh, over our head and really forced us to rethink what's the norm, um, it's a pretty exciting feature of what's to come here in the future. Uh, come. Um, and, and once we get back to being in person, um, you know, the reality is, is, you know, we are going to start being in person to do more collaboration. We're going to be visiting with customers and otherwise it's human nature to, to have that personal conversation uh, that we all need to develop great products that people want and need. However, I think companies and, and even each other employees are going to realize there were actually some efficiencies gained by being able to, to work from home or work remotely. Um, I think employees are going to start looking at it as a perk and, you know, maybe a way to skip the commute and, and the free food. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, there's still going to be a need to be in person. Um, so we really believe that there's going to be a mixed reality of collaboration in the future, um, you know, with, with both in-person and remote teams contributing at the same time. Um, and although this, you know, product, you know, I think the technology we talked about today, the one that I'm most excited about is, is things like spatial, right? Something that's an ox a virtual reality or augmented reality that allows essentially, uh, you know, in-person and virtual um, team members uh, to uh, to uh, be able to participate.
So for tomorrow, I mean, for what's going to happen in the future, uh, we definitely see an increase in virtual workforce. Uh, we know several uh, teams that we're working with uh, actually plan to go remote, uh, remote permanently. Uh, some of our clients are actually part, starting to put that in place, and I think part of that is because companies are realizing some operational cost savings as a result. Uh, it may also even allow for additional flexibility in hiring the right candidates um, that allow you to get that, uh, that individual um, that essentially may not want to be moving to uh, where your headquarters are at. Um, but all, you know, with all this, you know, it, these technologies do require new investments, um, and I think they are going to definitely be uh, in the future for us to help improve collaborations. And I think we're going to quickly realize that web meetings it's kind of like having a pager back in the past, right? Um, it worked so far, but I think that we're going to have some other things that are going to be eventually uh, replacing it. Um, and then office spaces are, are probably likely to turn into a place where there's specialized tools. Um, it's not necessarily a place that you just go to do work. Um, it's a place that you go to do builds, to do uh, prototype evaluations or otherwise. But otherwise, a lot of that work can probably go back to the, to the home with some of these um, additional tools. I don't know about Gray, but, uh, you know, I think it's an exciting feature. It's going to be interesting to see what new technologies and efficiencies uh, we're going to be gained as a result. And I think with pandemic, it really forced us to do something outside of our comfort zone. But as human nature, we, um, you know, mothers, the, the reason for all inventions. And I think what we're going to find out here is, um, you know, there's some things that uh, we're going to be doing differently and better uh, as a result. You bet. I'm just glad I'm not in the commercial real estate market right now. <laughs> All right. So um, I think that that's concludes our presentation as folks are typing in their questions and um, typing in their thoughts around virtual tools that um, are being used. Um, I just wanted to point you all to the Insight section of our website, m3design.com, under the Insights tab. Here you can find information about upcoming webcasts and articles that we regularly publish in our area of expertise. Um, if you want to be able to stay in the loop about upcoming webcasts, there's a place where you can put in your information and we will let you know when those are happening. All right, let's get to the questions. Um, so first, which tools have still have value after teams start going back to the office and resume business travel? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Let me start. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, I think you know a lot of the tools we talked about here, or just even just the techniques or that um, do have some value, um, at least in the short term. I think you know. We've seen some benefit on using a consolidated system such as Microsoft Teams. Uh, not to say that's the only thing to do, uh, but RC Miro and Onshape are definitely things that, you know, they were around before we were forced to go remote, um, but are definitely going to be things that we're going to be using even more so now uh, moving forward. We saw some efficiencies in a lot of different areas there too um, as well. So um, related to like VR and AR and some of these other more uh, being able to have uh, different types of experiences, I think, you know, we'll definitely see a bigger uptick on some of those tools in terms of how they're being developed. And and, then, and part of that, I think in the past, they always kind of seen as a uh, kind of a you know, gimmicky kind of thing. Um, I think uh, what's realized is that there may actually be some true potential in this, um, and we're going to start seeing some of that development happening and, and being coming front and center. Yeah, and I think especially VR in particular for like large scale uh, prototyping, right, visualization is going to have a key role. Because frankly, there's no other real cost-effective way to do that. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Customer evaluations. You know, I think we're still going to see some of that stuff being in person, but I think we'll we'll see some different ways of doing it, being using different camera views, 360 cameras. Uh, but again, like I said before, I think you know things like spatial. I'm really excited about because what that allows is that it doesn't matter if you're in person or, or remote. Um, you still can collaborate. Um, and you're not that one person that's dialed into the web meeting, for instance. So. Um, it's always, it, it always, nothing's worse than being the one person not in the room. Um, and so at least that way it allows for everyone to be uh, on the same level playing field and be able to contribute equally. Steve asked, what other methods or tools are out there for digitizing work that maybe you didn't include in this presentation? 
Yeah, there is a lot. Uh, you know, I, I kind of mentioned earlier Google, but you know, Google Docs, Microsoft Online. You know, both of them have collaboration uh, editing tools, uh, typically for office kind of documents, right? Uh, there's things like Wacom tablets or Wacom, <laughs> how you want to pronounce that. Uh, touch screens for sketching during brainstorms, things like that, and those are becoming much lower cost and uh, much higher resolution, so they're becoming very useful. Um, using multiple cameras for online meetings, you know, having a top-down or first-person first view camera can, uh, you know, really uh, make it more, I guess, interactive, right? Uh, cheap three uh, yeah, cheap three D printers. I think I mentioned this before, but these things are getting like you know, really inexpensive, and it, and it may be at some point that instead of shipping prototypes, you know, we just email a 3D file and have somebody print their own, right? Yeah. There certainly, there'll certainly be some of that. Um, and then, like, for uh, really inexpensive VR, you got things like uh, Google Cardboard, right? Now, there is probably the lowest tech piece of equipment you can get for VR, right? You just need that in a smartphone, and you're good to go. And everybody pretty much has a smartphone these days already. And then one of my personal favorites, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen this uh, on the internet recently, but the the new iPhone 12 has a uh, LiDAR capability, right? So I've seen people that are like 3D scanning their, their rooms and prototypes and, you know, all sorts of interesting things. I, I, it's kind of clunky right now. It doesn't look really great, but um, that mm -hmm. kind of shows you the potential for that technology in a, uh, in a small device. Yeah, I can see us using that, uh, scanning a, an environment, and then placing products in space and making sure that the layout, the workflow is all seamless uh, for the end user. So, yeah. so great. And you know, going back to the topic of um, like real estate and office space, like one of the things that I've, this is slightly off topic, but one of the things I've found to be interesting lately is some of our clients have been reaching out, out to us about um, creating these like immersive innovation spaces at their at their facilities, you know, with things like trade shows and like these like major sales events going away, they've been asking us to help them kind of think through how their environment is being designed so they can bring like one or two clients in at a time and have kind of this like specialized experience together that um, you know is not really crowded. So it's kind of an interesting way of investing back in the facility and creating kind of different opportunities there. So, and I think I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Did anybody? Excuse me, Last anybody, chance, people. There's anything we didn't cover? Good. All right. I'm gonna call time. Well, thank yeah. you everyone for joining us today. Um, appreciate all the attendees being here with us and we will be in touch in the future as we have other webcasts scheduled. Yeah. Stay safe out there and uh, feel free to reach out. If there's anything we can do to help you get through this, let us know. We'll do or, our best. Or if you have any new tools that uh, you're using, uh, please share as well. Um, nothing's better here than being able to leverage every everyone and I uh, appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you. Okay. Bye.